I'm Katrina and this is So and Terror and I am going to be showing you most of one of my talks from QuailCon. I did two of them, two master classes about raising quail and aviaries. So I'm going to be showing you that and then a little surprise to end. Let's find out what it is. Um, All right, everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. If you didn't, you didn't answer. It's okay. Um, so, like you said, I raise um, quail and aviary. I have a backyard setting, so I am on 7,000 square foot lot, and aviaries to me are the best way to do quail, best way to raise them. Um, we had a special request talking about poo. Any other special requests before we get into this? Because that's already on the list. <laughs> Something you particularly can't hear me? Okay. So, um, first off, is why would you choose an aviary over a cage system? You know, in the quilt community, you hear a lot about cages and you know the three birds per per square foot in the cage, and you know they they raise them that way. That's the typical um, way people raise them. In an aviary setting, they are it's more natural. Okay, you, you get more natural behaviors in an aviary. And to me, I believe that makes them um, happier. Because you see them, they're, they're actually um, dust bathing in, in whatever the substrate is. I use, I use wood chips. And they dust bathe in that. They're, they're kicking out things, they're scratching. They don't scratch quite like chickens, but they do scratch and look for bugs. Oh my gosh, if you want to have fun, go out at night with a flashlight to find a bug. They're gonna go after it. They're super good hunters. So they actually have a lot of, they will chase down bugs, they'll eat the plants that you give them and in there as well, but they do have some amount of foraging, which I believe is beneficial as well. So um, the more natural environment, you could also with that, if you sell eggs or sell quail, in some areas, doesn't work everywhere, but in some areas you can increase your prices because you have happy birds. You have birds that are not in, you know, battery cages and, and stuff like this. And in certain communities, they will pay more. Not going to happen everywhere. Some people don't care. <laughs> but that is one benefit that you might not think of when you're starting. Because um, most people, when they start, they don't think of selling. They think of selling when they get too many. <laughs> so natural is good. Um, another thing that happens is you get more space per bird. So in a cage system, <laughs> cages tend to be smaller. I mean, Zach's cages are pretty big, but even his cages are smaller than an aviary can be. So one bird has that many square foot. Um, there's not a lot of ordinances on, about quail. Um, there are some places that do include quail in their ordinances. So that's why a lot of people grow quail instead of chicken is because of the ordinance situation. There are some ordinances about any bird has to have X amount of square feet per bird. And you're gonna to have to read your rules, your individual rules, but that usually is interpreted, this bird has this many square feet. So does the bird next to it, right? They're sharing that square footage, but they still have that amount. And they have room to run, room to, to move and, and all of that. Um, and so that you're, you're satisfying any space laws that happen. There's some states that have it, some states don't have it, some local municipalities have it. And then also you are giving the birds just a bigger space to have their life, uh, which is great. Um, another thing is save time and money. So when you're in a cage um, system, your time is spent, your time isn't spent on egg collection because that's pretty easy. Your time is spent on poop, right? You have to manage that poop, what? You guys have them currently? How often do you manage your poop? A couple times a week. Mm -hmm. Two hours a yeah. day. So two hours a day? So I mean, it depends how many you have. Right, it is good fertilizer, but you have to be there to, to do that a lot. Um, the way I raise them is with deep litter, and that takes care of that for me. It's so much, you spend so much less time doing that. So what does that mean? So I'm gonna go over that. Um, uh, yeah, so, and then as far as money goes is you're not putting things into your system 
that are taking money. So like cages cost quite a bit. You can build an aviary for, you know, some cages cost quite a bit. You might be able to build an aviary for nearly the same cost, um, which is good. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the deep reader in a little bit, but first I want to go through design considerations. So when you have a cage system, you're going for that short cage so they don't pop up and break their neck, right? When aviary system, you should be going for six feet or higher. So it's eight to 12 inches is the, is the short end on a cage and six feet or higher is what it should be in an aviary. And the reason why it's short or tall is because think about if you have a shelf right here and you're getting up and you bump your head, but you're getting up full strength, it hurts, but you're okay. <laughs> um, if you were to jump up and hit something much higher when you already have that momentum, that's gonna hurt more, <laughs> right? It might knock you out. And in the case of quail, it may break a neck, right? It might get a brain injury. So you want to have that, um, that six feet tall so that they top out before they hit it. Now birds, my birds typically top out about five and a half feet. They, they start to lose momentum. So they flush and they lose momentum at the top. So that's why the six feet. Um, another thing about the six feet is if you do use deep litter, you need to have the top of where your deep litter will be needs to be zero and six feet above that. So if you're building a system, you may want seven foot tall system if you have a foot of deep litter, right? So these are things to think about when designing your, your aviary. Um, another thing about deep litter is it's deep and you have a door. And you open the door, what's gonna happen? <laughs> it's all gonna fall out, right? So what I have done and what I suggest people do is actually build up your, so your door is a foot off the ground. So you step into your aviary because then you're, you're not letting the chips go out. You're not um, doing any of that. And also when your wood chips are, are further down, um, the birds are like, oh, that's a wall, right? And they're not going to come out when you open, open the door. So um, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. Um, so the next thing is substrate. Now we're getting into deep litter. <laughs> so deep litter is what I use. You can use different substrates. Some people use sand and that works. Um, that gets really, really, really stinky if it gets wet and it takes a very long time to dry out. Quail poop gets stinky when it's wet. Same thing's going to happen in an aviary setting, right? If it gets water, it's going to get stinky. But it's a better solution because then um, if it does get wet, you just add more wood chips on top and the smell goes away and it will pro it will start to decompose. Um, so deep litter for me is wood chips. Um, depending on where you live, you may have you know tree trimmers and you know tree trucks that you hear that you hear the chipper going. To me, that's oh I better go and ask them if I can have their chips. <laughs> um, yes. There's a website Chip called. Drop. Yep. yep. What's yep. it called? Yeah. Chip Drop. Oh, everybody knows it. Chipdrop.com, and all you do is sign up, and when they're in your neighborhood, they drop them off. The thing about that is they don't tell you when it's coming, <laughs> and they, you better have your car out of the garage. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so you can go on on site like Chip Drop, or you can. Um, I've developed a relationship with a couple arborists in my neighborhood or in my, in my area, and if they have chips, and I can call them and say, hey, I'm looking for chips anytime in the next two months, you have chips, bring them by. Um, when you get these chips in that way, it is important that you know how big, they're gonna stand up the whole truck. They're not gonna give you one wheelbarrow, right? They're gonna dump the whole truck. So have a space that has that, you know, whether that's in your, in your, in your driveway or in the front yard or, or something like that. Um, myself, I have it in the in the back alleyway. I have a two car two car garage back there, and one doesn't have a car. So I put I block that off with wood chips. But you will, if you're going with those two trimmers, you will get the whole load. Um, now maybe they were nice and dump half of it. That's gonna be hard for them to do with their trucks, but it's not gonna happen. <laughs> 
Um, so something to consider is when you have decomposition happening, that that's what's going to happen is you have your wood, your wood pile, your wood chip deep litter. Those are your browns, right? You, people know composting here, browns and greens. Is it, is it any kind of tree chips? So anything except for cedar. And I would also note, you know, poison oak. <laughs> How about cherry? That almond's not good either. That almond's poisonous. For birds. How about I've cherry? I've heard that. Just about everything. Okay. So yeah, maybe maybe avoid that too. Um, I kind of stand up. Oh, you're just gonna like this. <laughs> I want to know about cherry wood because that's poisonous to dogs. To eat, right? Right. I don't. So they're not gonna be eating it. Okay, so it's the cedar chips, the smell, the scent? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, they're not going to eat it, so they're going to be fine. Yeah, the only one I've heard is, is cedar to avoid, and that's because there is an off-gassing. And, I mean, when you're cutting cedar, you should be wearing a mask to... It smells so good. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Um, <laughs> but that is that is something that is throughout, like, species. It's not just birds or anything okay. like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would also say, do you have clean chips? Because sometimes they have a bunch of garbage that's also in there, which is up to you whether you want to pick it out, right? Um, and I would say, um, you know, if you're in an area with poison oak or poison ivy or some other poisonous, itchy plant, I would ask them. I always ask them what's in it anyway, because they don't know. They're, they're going to know what's in their truck. Um, but what that is, is they give it to you for free. Because otherwise they have to take it to the dump. So that's, I mean, that's wonderful. Um, but what you're, what you're doing when you do deep litter is you are making a compost pile under your birds. So when you get chipped trees, which is preferable to like pine shavings, some people, you go to Tractor Supply, you get your pine shavings, you put it out there, it will work. If you don't have access to a, a, you know, a chipper um, and you have access to the bagged pine shavings, that will work perfectly. Um, but it works better if you have some greens in there. So if there's the, the leaves in there that get chipped up and the, the green, like fresh growing wood, that will have a more dynamic compos decomposition happening and it will, um, it will deal with your waste faster. Does that make sense? It's gonna have a better, better compost pile. So do you change out this No, thing? so basically what I do is, so the, the quail are going to poop we know this. They're quail. <laughs> <Yeah>. Zach warned us. <laughs> but the, the quail are going to, going to poop. In my aviary and in people aviaries that I know, they generally concentrate most of the manure around the outside, around edges. So that's something to think about when you're doing that. But um, I use a pitchfork. I use a little pitchfork and once a week or once, maybe sometimes I go too long, <laughs> sometimes I do it more. You just pitch it, turn it. And that's all you need to do. And it takes, you know, my my one aviary is like 70 square feet, so 10 by seven. Wow. And it takes me like five minutes. And I do that once a week. So how, how many times did you say? Oh, well, a couple a times a week, and it takes about two two hours. I kind of do it slowly, because they're so cute. I yeah. like to look at them and watch them a little bit, but, <laughs> but, but the benefit, approximately two hours. Exactly, and so that's saving you time. Right. And you can spend that time sitting in your aviary watching your birds because what's awesome is after you turn it, after you turn it, they pick through it and they are having the time of their lives right. because they are finding, I don't know what. Bugs. <laughs> They're finding all sorts of stuff um, to eat and play and all of that. So it's it's really beneficial to do that and it's super easy. You have a question. Oh, how many quail do you keep in there? And then what do you, do you do anything for like warming or do you notice any problems with that from being on the ground? For warming? So they're, they're not on the ground. They're on a, a compost pile, right? So I, I, when I started them, I did have, I did start with them on the ground and I only had six birds, right? I had one breeding group and I didn't do anything with the poop. It just dried up. <laughs> I mean, you know, six birds, 70 square feet, don't really have to do anything. Um, but, and I didn't see anything with that. I did, um, once you have that compost pile on there, they don't, they no longer have contact with the soil. So that's something I so far have not had to can be concerned about. If someone who does this and has that, uh, the wood chips and stuff and has that problem, speak up because we want to know. 
Um, but you're, you're basically taking them off the ground and onto a compost pile, basically. Um, and then the second question is how many can you fit? So in, in our cage systems, we've heard three birds per square, per square foot. Well, I'm gonna tell you that if you put three birds per square foot in an aviary, you're gonna be out there spending the time turning it over poop, right? So I generally say the amount of birds you have in the aviary is going to depend on the amount of poop management you want to do. Right? One bird per square foot, that's probably as many as I would do. I have had more in there, um, and it works. But then what about, the next question that follows that is always, well, what about their territorial, right? So the three birds per square foot, the reasoning for that in the, in the cages is that it's dense enough that they don't have, they don't hold territories. In the aviary, yeah, they're gonna hold some territories, that's fine. But the key thing in this is they have space to run away, right? They're not going around in a circle trying to get out of, out of somebody's way. <laughs> They can go out of the way. And there is chasing. I've never had like a fight fight, but I've definitely had get out of my space. And he's like, okay, fine. You know? Do you have any type of ratio? So it's the same ratio. Yeah, it's a five to one ratio. Um, same ratio. And actually, if, if, you have, if you have a lot of birds, it's completely fine to add in a couple more males. Because... Again, they can go away if they need to, and you're gonna have to you're gonna have to base that on how your birds are acting and how they're looking. So, when I choose males, it's going to be ones that are nice to the females. So, number one is big for me. You may have a different category. You may want the pretty ones, right? So, they're gonna for me they're gonna be big ones that are healthy. And how do you treat your ladies? So, I actually will choose several more than I need take the other ones out of the population. Coach, watch out. <gasps> and, <laughs> thank you. That's not happy. Um, take them out of the population. <laughs> and, um, and then I'll observe their behavior. So I'll be like, okay, I need five, I'm gonna keep eight. And before I do that, I observe their behavior as well. But you're gonna have a population dynamic that is different once those other ones are out of the out of the system, right? You have to reestablish some pecking orders and stuff like that. So that's what I do, and you can see that a lot better than in a cage. When you're in the aviary and you have a, a seating place in your aviary, I recommend that because why do you have an aviary if you don't have a place to be in there with them, right? <laughs> um, and you can sit there and we watch them, and you say, okay, well, he's is he doing his job? Do the ladies let him do the job? Because I had one that he was like, oh, yeah, you're you're awesome, dude. And they did not like him. So I'm like, well, I guess you're not staying. <laughs> so I think I think that's that's what you have to assess when you when you have an aviary. You're going to have a different setting and a different kind of relationship with the birds. So. So what do you do for inclement weather? I, I, right. Mine would be freezing right. in Michigan. However. Yeah. Even rain, even hot sun. So I, I'm in California. I want to I want to preface that we don't really have winter. <laughs> it's gotten down to 22 degrees. But um, they people raise them in Alaska, and they are completely in fine. Yeah. Um, I, I think I believe so. And so the things you want to protect from are um, see we're on the list. <laughs> so predator protection. So what are your predators in the area? And for, for me, it's gonna be, you know, rats and, and uh, raccoons, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you protect from them? For me, that's digging down, um, you know, foot down with my hardware cloth all the way around, making sure everything's sealed up, they can't get it. Um, it's also using the appropriate locks. I use a gate lock with a carabiner. That would be very difficult for little raccoon hands, they are talented, but it'd be very difficult for little raccoon hands to get that off. And, you know, if you don't have a carabiner, they can totally get in there you know, with a like, gate latch. Um, now, if you have foxes, they're a little bit more crafty. You know, if you have, um, there's a lot of different predators. So you have, to, you have to think about how those predators would be there. The one thing I'm not too sure about how you do that is bears, but ask Jasmine. She has bears in her area, and she's like, they haven't come in. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, but there you have to basically plan for, for predators and then weather. So my predator and my weather, part of it is the same, uh, part of the barriers. Coturnix quail, a predator is both one that gets in and gets the birds and one that they can see and perceive as a predator. So that can, can make them stop laying. Um, if they're like, oh my gosh, it's a predator right there, it's going to get me, I'm going to stop laying. So I, what I use is, <laughs> what I use is a, a two, two and a half foot um, tall shade cloth around along the bottom, and that gives a visual barrier. So that plays actually three roles. It's a visual barrier for, for predators, uh, for the quail to see predators. Um, it helps keep it in the chips when they start to decompose through the, through the hardware cloth and it protects from wind. So the wind protection is something you need to need to pay attention to and precipitation. So they're good in, in hotter weather, good in cooler weather. If you have if you have deep litter, what they what they do in the hot weather is they literally dig themselves a little hole, like they'll be that far underground, like the little heads will be that far underground and they sit there and they're insulated and they pant. And I mean, we had 115 degrees and they were fine. They were active in the morning and the evening, and they, and they spend that way um, in the middle of the day. So my assumption is in winter they would do the same, is make themselves an insulated um, you know, little divot, and, they, and then be active. So you don't have like a little shed in there or something? So I do have a sandbox. Um, I have a sandbox that is covered, which I highly recommend covered sandboxes. You guys ever have a sandbox that's not covered? Mm -hmm. What happens? They kick the sand in it. You don't have any more sand, right? You have a lot of dust. I have a bath. <laughs> you have a bath. Um, yeah, so I, I recommend a covered sandbox, and I do two en two entrances so that if one needs to get out, another one can enter. They can just go out a different way. Um, but that also doubles as if they if they feel like they are unsafe, they can go into there. You know, they can go in there and it can be a safe place for them. Yeah. But the second thing for the weather, so wind and precipitation. Um, precipitation, deep litter, wood chips. Um, wood chips by themselves don't stink. Wood chips plus quail poop stinks. <laughs> if it gets wet, okay? If it gets wet. So your roof needs to cover and extend past where the, um, where the edge of the chips are. So like, if you're like, if you're here's your roof, your chips are right here. It's gonna stink because it's gonna it's gonna soak in. So if here's your roof, you want your 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 actual aviary to end somewhere in here, um, and that's to avoid that situation. Now, if your if your wood chips do get wet, they take forever to dry out, and it's best to cover them with dry wood chips and then cover that area. Make sure that you have it covered up. I was in a situation this winter in California. We had tons of rain, tons of rain, and we usually get rain, when, always, except for this winter. <laughs> uh, the rain came in from the north. We always had north driven, and then this year it came in from the south. So the way I had built my aviary, I was getting rain in a different direction and I hadn't protected that. So I ended up putting a tarp up over the whole thing on that side, which was also where the door was, so I had to like scoot in. <laughs> But you can have temporary solutions for your weather issues. So I know um, people have wrapped hutches in like some plastic stuff or like feed bags, put that up. If you feel you're having you know really cold weather come in and maybe it's a snap, then that might be something you consider is let's just put up the tarp. If I'm going, if I go away, if we go away, my neighbor can come over and go, yeah, they still have food, oh, oh, the water looks good? Yeah. They can collect eggs or not, right, at that point. You just need someone to say, oh, okay, you're good. You can go away for a weekend and not have to worry about not telling them, right? Well, I've rabbits, so it's still good, but. Do they like bushes for any kind of vegetation? Yeah, so I, I have, uh, I used to have a current in there 
Oh, and it just awesome. was that I built, I built the aviary around it. It was already yeah, there. I forgot to tell you. And I, it's, uh, they loved it. Really they, really there was a browse line. They would jump for it. Yeah. And there was like a I browse line the other on this one bush. One it was tremendously yeah. hard to collect yeah. eggs yeah. because I had to get behind the bush. Um, and when I turned the litter, I would always catch on on the bush that kept on going out. So that's something that you have to find your own balance in is efficiency versus versus you know cutesy or or all you know all that what i do is i actually give them some plants yeah, and throw it in there and they're definitely happy with that so they're in my big cage they all end up with the sand and it's very efficient how do you find eggs we're going to get to eggs in a minute so the second automatic thing that i do is water and i have a very long video very thorough you know stuff, you can skip skip parts of it, um, of how to make an ever-flowing water, an automatic water that never runs out of water. This only happens not in winter. <laughs> if you want to add heat taper or make it cycled, then that's, that you can, you can make those adjustments. But if you have it hooked up to a faucet that's always on, then you can make a, a float valve-driven water, which is basically a bucket that goes to your computers and you won't have to worry about water ever. And I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, and then um, the other things about, it's not really design, but things to consider when you are um, having your aviary is your egg collection, right? So we just talked about that. Egg collection, if you have them in a hutch and you have your, your sandbox, that's where they're gonna lay. If you have an aviary, you might get some to lay in there. Those will be your cleanest eggs. <laughs> but they lay everywhere. They lay wherever they feel like it. Typically, they will always lay in the same spot, but not as each other. <laughs> Sometimes you get that. I have one aviary that actually, I have two aviaries. I have one aviary that has decided that that corner and that corner is where they're going to lay, except for two in the middle, which is handy. But in general, you're going to have them lay wherever they're going to lay. And you will know, you'll get into the habit, oh, this egg here, there's going to be an egg there. Oh, where is that egg? It's not there? Oh, it's, it's a foot over here. They're going to basically lay in the same spot every time until they decide to switch it up. <laughs> but they will, they will lay in the same spot basically every time. But... Who knows what this If you know, know what this is, don't say anything. If you don't know what this is, what do you think it is? Okay. You guys know? I use... This is a, it's a ravioli strainer. Right? From the dollar store. And I tape it on a stick, a broom thing, or whatever. And you can pick up your eggs. Like that. And I mean, this costs what a dollar twenty-five now because not a dollar store anymore. Oh yeah. <laughs> Plus tax. Five quarters. How much does that cost? You already you don't have to be a broomstick. It can be a stick. Okay. How'd you get that on the airplane? Is what I want to know. I well I I got this on the airplane. This is Jenna's. <laughs> <laughs> this part's Jenna's. <laughs> but um, this is a super simple thing that will save your back. If you need to reach behind plants or behind other things. You can do that. You can reach quite a bit. This is very handy. I have one aviary that I have rabbits in. Now, how do you, I just told you you got to be six feet, right? I have rabbits, and they're, they're you know, pretty low. I added aviary netting below the rabbits so that if quail jump, they jump, they bounce off the aviary netting, and it's not a hard landing. So that's an adjustment that you can make, right? Do people understand that? Did I say that too quick? You safety, you safety the. I baby creeped it. Yeah. <laughs> you quail creeped it. Yeah. Uh, but I use this to get underneath where the rabbits are, so I can squat down. In a, in a normal aviary, you can just pick it up. There you go. But the other one, I squat down and I, I go like this. It's all good. <laughs> Can I do that? No. No, no the wind did that. Wind. Wind's like, oh, look, you put a chair there? Okay, I'll go the opposite. <laughs> drama. <laughs> this is the most drama we have here that we're We need to rope that up, don't we? Right, I'm going to stand on that. 
Why did the tuna and fall? We we moved our our cage into our chicken run. They love it. Yeah. And I I'm doing better with the feed, but boy, any waste of feed is very happily helped. I love chicken. Thank you. We're always thinking about them all the time. Or a bad egg I just throw on the ground. <laughs> so bad eggs I just crush because they're not they're not really strong enough to peck through like chickens are. So I just crush them and let it ruin. That's what I do. But um, yeah, so this is a good a good thing. Um, question? No, it's okay. You can stretch. You should all be stretching. I've got, I've got ducks in the mine, so what if they So another thing that happens in aviaries that doesn't typically happen in cage systems is you can get a breed quit. Um, I have had one group of ladies hatch once. <laughs> There was four involved and they all sat on the nest, right? They all took turns. Um, generally, when you have one sitting on the nest, sometimes they, I've heard of them hatching them, um, but generally they get bored, right? Or they get up too, too much. But if you, I had four ladies that were rotating and they actually took it all the way and hatched and it was great. Um, but that is something you can, you can promote in your aviary. Give them space, safe spaces, give them something covered, you know, you know it has to be covered, but give them some, some area that is a little bit more protected, like a corner or, you know, you can make a lean-to that has two two entrances, and those, those are really good. Um, do the, if they go broody, do they stop laying? Yep. So if they go broody, they stop laying, and if you have several grow broody, like I did, I had four ladies that went broody, and they all stop laying. So they have eggs. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, it's something that, that can happen in the aviary and doesn't typically happen anywhere else, which is fantastic, I think. Um, okay, we talked a little bit about entertainment versus efficiency. Go ahead. Um, my friend noticed you mentioned rabbits. Do you keep rabbits and quail together, but you said you kept them Yeah, so I have, I call it my rabiary. <laughs> um, party time. Uh, yeah, so I have rabbits over quail, and... The thing about the thing about that is you get a lot more moisture into your into your deep litter, which is good good for, for decomposition. It, you know, compost piles are good with some moisture. Quail don't pee, right? Um, and it adds it adds the manure to, of the rabbit as well. And yeah, it's it, and the whole thing is once you have the deep litter and once you have it. Um, you add the deep litter, you add more when it's stinky, right? If you, if you turned it and turned it and turned it and it's still stinky, we add more. Um, and then at some point when it's broken down, you can sift it out and use it as compost. So when you have rabbits and quail, you have, you have different types of manures going in the system, which makes a better compost. So you don't ever try the rabbits and the quail together, like on the ground? On the I ground, know, no. I know they do the chickens on the ground, the rabbit will actually sort through it and self-compost the, the, the ground pepper. I, that was kind of like I kind of believe like there's some disease potential disease, disease, disease issues between rabbits and birds, and that's why we have them above. So that's, I mean, potential, right? So whether or not it actually happens, someone can do it for years and years and years and not have a problem, and someone can do it and it could be bad. So. It's going to be a risk assessment that you'll have to you have to make. Yeah, but what I do is I I actually you know I shovel it in. You know I or I I, I uh, use a pitchfork and pitchfork it in. So yeah. How do you recommend that we add birds to our aviary? So adding birds to an aviary is actually really easy. It's really easy. So I've added adult birds and I've added juvenile birds. birds. So. Um, people generally recommend between three and four weeks old you put them in um, with adults because they don't have their adult hormones yet. So the adults are like, ah, that's a baby, that's not competition. Um, and what happens, I, I do it the same way whether it's an adult or a, or a three week old, four week old. And that is, I do it at dusk because they're going to go to sleep and then they're going to go wake up with new neighbors. <laughs> That's generally the best way to do it. I distract them, okay? 
Those are the two things. How I distract them is I fork up the, the whole thing right before I put the next one in. And then I put them in while the adult birds, while the existing birds are busy. They're busy doing stuff. I don't, don't bother me, I'm, I'm finding stuff here. Okay, you're distracting them. And that generally worked pretty well. I don't think I've ever had an issue with that, um, doing it that way. The only issue I had is one time I had a male that was very focused on all females, <laughs> even the three weeks old. So what I did with him, well, him, there was two of them, is I just, I made male jail. I had a, a animal carrier thing that was all wire, and I put that in the aviary. I put them in there, gave them their own food and water, and they were fine. It was so funny because the little babies were small enough that they could go in, <laughs> and then they come out. But what he, he was trying to mount the, the, the girls were too young, right? And so that's what I did, and I mean, you wouldn't get fertile eggs from those individuals during that time, so you, you may come up with a different solution. For me, that's how, it, that's how I work. And what that does is it keeps those animals in that pecking order and in that family, so you don't have to reintroduce them and recap them. So, so yeah, those are my two tips is do it in the evening and do it um, some way to distract them. So, I mean, I've even done it where you have that and you throw in, you know, they love marjoram, throw in stuff for them to eat. Because that is just, they're busy. They don't have time to fight. And they also have enough room, right? Does that answer your question? Okay. You had a question? That was the same question. <laughs> what are they throwing in to feed them? What do they like the best? They like, oh, well, it depends what aviary it is. It's kind of funny. I, I treat my aviaries a little bit different based on what grows near them. <laughs> so one of them has an, a, a marjoram plant. They get more marjoram than the other one does. <laughs> but um, they, they love marjoram. They love um, zucchini leaves. Like right now, your zucchinis, or when you take your zucchini out, just throw the whole things in and they'll eat them. Watermelon um, rind. Watermelon rind. Anything with an aphid on it? Right. That's tasty. Have you them autumn olives? I don't have all autumn olives, so I don't know. Those leaves might be a little tough for them. I'm talking about the berries. Oh, the berries. I haven't done that. Well, no, online, I said yeah. you can feed them to them. I'm going to try it. When I yeah. Come back times of all of it. Let us know. Yeah. <coughs> because, I mean. All of two. I haven't tried it yet, but I can't see why they do it. Yeah. I was thinking leaves. <laughs> but, yeah, anything anything that comes out of your garden is tomatoes? fine for them, except for except for the leaves of the, of the tomato potato family. So the leaves, they're not, and the, and not the potatoes. Good. But the, yeah, that's the same family. Um, and then no citrus, no avocado, no iceberg lettuce. There's a few other things, but that's is, the meat. Sweet whole tomatoes? Tomatoes are fine. Yeah. Green or red? Yeah. Sweet potatoes? Uh, I don't give them, I, I mean, I've given my so chickens sweet potato peels. But, and they, they did fine. <laughs> the but leaves? they were cooked. The huh? How about the leaves? Uh, sweet potato leaves, yes. Sweet potato leaves, you can eat too. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so I asked. Yeah. 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 Um, so I do an aviary setting, and like you, I put my chicks in at about right now three weeks in my kitchen to pour when winter comes around to find those to hold for. But my question is with feed, because I know there's different protein requirements for chicks and... I did not answer my question fully. <laughs> for adults, so I've been struggling with how to handle that in my aviary, because when they're in the brood, it's easy, they're on the starter. When I take them out to the aviary, I mean, I could keep my adults on the high protein, but that's very not very cost efficient. So what what I I'll tell you what I do. What I do is I change the feed to the baby feed. I change it to I, I use 27% starter. It's the higher percent starter, but I also always have um, you always have grit in your aviary. That's important. Um, you can use granite, which does not have calcium. If you want to add calcium, you can use a limestone grit, which is, it's called bird grit. So you can add your own grit. It's not there because they're on soil. Because they don't have soil, because they're on wood chips. Yeah. Um, but I, I have that limestone grit already there. So 
that's really the only additional thing they need from the, the starter is the grit, is the limestone. So they have that already. And then I just put them on baby food and they're gonna, their poop's gonna stay. <laughs> do they have a sandbox? They don't use that for food? They do use that. Yeah, sandbox used for grit as well. Um, and it's funny with the, with the limestone grit, they will actually, they'll use it and then they like not touch it for a long time and it's like oh maybe here and there and then like sometimes they eat a lot of it sometimes they eat less of it um, limestone grit is like a medium a medium level of time so it lasts a medium level of time the granite grit lasts a very long time in their in their system so they don't need as much of it um, or they don't need it as often because it takes a long time to break down so yeah yeah, that's right. Sand is a good grip. Yep. yep. I go down to the ocean and I get the drift sand. It has little pieces of shell on it. Yep. The ocean. I don't I know what salt it. does to that. Do, do they have a salt? They put salt in their feet. Yeah. Now, usually this, this sand up here has been rained on and rained oh, okay. on. and yeah. It's kind of washed all the salt out of it. Yeah. It's what's in the parking lot that blows off the beach to find stuff. They love it. Yeah. It's a good calcium. Yeah. So, all right, I was going to go over. What was that? Do you add calcium to the food? That is the limestone grit. The limestone's calcium. So that's that's what I add. I don't add it to the feed. I add it as a separate side dish. Yeah. So I wanted to go over one other thing. Um, is the prey mindset. So when we're when we have cages. People pretty much, you know, they put the hand in and they take it out and, and whatever happens and there happens. When you have, have an aviary setting, you need to realize that you are a giant, <laughs> right? And that they are prey animals. So if you have skittish quail, the way to get them used to you is one, I announce my presence before they see me. I start talking. I talk about them. But I start talking before they even see me. Hey guys, I'm coming. And that way it's not a shock that some giant is there at the door opening it, right? Um, they know that, they expect it. Um, the other thing that happens with that is if you have skittish quail, stand outside your aviary a little bit. Let them get used to you. Um, if you have really skittish quail, you're gonna need to spend a lot of time with them. So the prey mindset is, Oh my gosh, you're going to eat me. Everybody's going to eat me, right? It takes most prey about 15 minutes to figure out if you're going to eat them or not. Okay? So you can sit next to the next to the aviary. This is again, you're not going to have to do this every day, but when you're starting and you if you if you do have Spanish quail, you sit next to the aviary still works with with uh, cages as well. And you sit there and you might talk to them, get them used to you, used to you being there, maybe move around a little bit, not a whole lot, until they're comfortable with you. And you can go in and do the same thing inside. You know, sit there, have a seating place in your area. I highly recommend that, it's fun to watch. And have that spot there and they will get used to you. They'll start coming up to you, they'll, they'll peck your shoes because you know, who knows what color your shoes are to them. But they, they see in a different light than we do. Um, but they, they will. They start investigating you once they are comfortable that you're not going to eat them. So I think that's really important. Fast movements right away, all that. You know, once they know who you are, you're good. But um, you have to get them comfortable with that first. Does that make sense? Okay. What do you catch them? How do you catch them? <laughs> so fishing net. I use what? Oh yeah, butterfly net. I use a butterfly net. I forgot that. Thank you, Erica. I the tools I use is this and a butterfly net. I don't use this to catch them. But when I am collecting eggs, I have this and I I scoot, you know, get the eggs. Well sometimes there's birds sitting on my eggs and I want them. I just use this and I scoot them. And and they're kind of freaked out for a little bit. Once they understand what's going on and they have experience, they're like, you're doing this again? Okay, and they'll just walk, they'll just like step two steps over, it's hilarious. So they, um, they do that and they get used to you touching them. Even if it's with this, they get used to you touching them. And so when you need to pick them up or want to pick them up, you can do that. And I do use a butterfly net 
Um, fishing net, uh, tractor supply. And yeah, fishing yeah. You do. Time. I do use a butterfly net, and you you catch them and you flip it so that they're hanging, and then that makes sense. You flip it so that it's closed, so that it's just there, and that's a really good way to catch them. But honestly, how I catch them most of the time is I just pick them up, and I pick them up across the back so that the show the uh, their wings are pinned, and they are. Um, I just pick them up on the back. <coughs> And, and they're sometimes they're fine with it, and sometimes they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Any questions? I do. I do. Go for it. Um, can you repeat the stuff like, uh, I know you said no tomato leaves or potato leaves. Nightshade family. Nightshade family. Nightshade family is, is tomato, tomato, potato, yeah. uh, eggplant. Peppers, petunias. Petunias? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Iceberg? My, my there's, you're going to have to look up what's an iceberg. There is something in iceberg that most animals should not have. Like that latex? And I don't, it's, there's actually something in it though. And, and I think it's like, if you feed them iceberg forever. I don't think, if you, you know, oh I have leftover salad, you want some. I don't think that's going to do. You shouldn't do yeah. that to rabbits either. Right, so it, it's something in iceberg that is specifically that is known. Right. Maybe you should eat some different Yeah, I eat iceberg. Can I ask one? Lettuce, that's an opiate. So. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask one thing? Are there specific benefits to doing quail in an aviary over a cage, or is it just like a personal preference? Health wise? Production wise? Like, are they? Product they're the same production. I get it. I get one bird per. One bird per egg? No. I get one egg per bird. <laughs> Sometimes two. You get that in a cage system too. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's. So it's more of like it's a the personal same. preference of yeah. how you enjoy this. Yep. How you want to enjoy them. Um, I would say that, and this is partially what I throw in to feed them and partially the bugs that they forage. Um, I have had people say that my eggs are sweet. So. That's going to be whatever you're feeding them. And back to your, you said something about worms. I do feed them pumpkin. Um, you can, and now's the time to think about this because come October, end of October into November, put it on next door or Craigslist. I will come get your pumpkins because you have, I still have, well, I just fed the last pumpkin from last year. I had pumpkins. Carrots. Carrots and well, they're too big for that. But you might get a pumpkin to grow. No, <laughs> pumpkin. no pumpkins help with parasites. Yeah, pumpkins help with, they deworm. It's a deworm. Now, is that just the seeds or is that the yeah. flesh? Yeah. I think it's the flesh. I think so. Do you do any supplemental Yes, I use a rope light. So the surprise at the end is. I will be creating a course for raising quail and aviaries. So the masterclass I gave, the, the, the talk that I gave at uh, QuailCon, just touched the, the main points, the, just touched the surface. There's so much more. Um, Linda with Quail University and I were have looking at stuff and I have put together a 10 page outline for this course. So. It is going to be a lot of good information and a lot of good information for you to have all in one place. Uh, the course will come out in 2024. We don't know when yet. I haven't started filming. It is going to be fantastic. It's going to be awesome. So look forward to that in 2024. And there's other courses that are coming out in 2024 as well. And so look for those next year. Have a wonderful day. Pass this along to everybody you know in the quail community so that they know what's going on and they're able to get this glimpse into raising quail in aviaries. And it was an awesome time. I enjoyed the QuailCon a lot and I enjoyed meeting you guys a lot. <laughs> it was awesome. So if you haven't liked this video, please like it. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, hit the bell notification, and select all so you get all the, all the notifications because we want you to get it all. So, share it around and enjoy the day.